This will be our 25th lesson in the book of Genesis. We'll be in the 16th chapter. <coughs> the birth of Ishmael. I do want to remind you that this this record is written several centuries after the events took place. So this actually the Holy Spirit wrote this. Yes, amen. Several centuries after it happened. So you don't want to criticize anybody in this text that the Holy Spirit didn't criticize. <laughs> this is his approach to this. Yes. And this is a very uh, controversial passage. Mm -hmm. But it, you sense there's no controversy in the spirit about it at all. <coughs> now, Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian. After Abram had dwelt ten years in the land, of Canaan and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarai said unto Abram, My wrong be upon thee. I had given my maid into thy bosom, and when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and thee. But Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness by the fountain in the way to sure. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou, and whither wilt thou go? She said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself unto her hands, under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, thou shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou, God, seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Therefore that well was called Beer Lay High Roy. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Berea. And Hagar bare Abram a son, and Abram called his son's name Ishmael called his son's name was Hagar bear Ishmael and Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bear Ishmael to Abram that's the Holy Spirit's revelation now Amen. of this period of time as I mentioned this uh, this text has provided some intellectual fodder for a lot of people that are fond of criticizing scriptural characters. Now, nobody should put up with this. Yeah, this is wrong. Mm -hmm. If God speaks well of a person, 
Well, God told Abraham, I'll curse them that curse you. That includes his critics. Amen. Amen. No matter what they say. Mm -hmm. God can't lie. So he's against whoever's against Abraham. Whoever picks at Abraham, Abraham, God's going to pick at them. That's just, that's just the way it is. I, I don't remember loose talk like this when I was uh, younger. It's only been in the last few decades that this kind of has kind of surfaced. And I credit it to the fact that the modern church has accepted psychology as a valid field of knowledge, which centers in the individual. You take, take the individual out and the science it's false and so called false to the ground. <clears throat> you remember there are even people that say Job, his sin was he feared. That which I feared has come upon me. So they well, in the charismatic circles say this. That Job was afraid. But Job was afraid of being abandoned by God and he thought that's what had happened and God God never did explain to Job what really had happened. Why not? Because Job's faith. Job outlasted the trial. But he's criticized, notwithstanding. Then people make statements like this. Well, they were sinners just like us. As though that one broad brush, intellectual brush, that accounts for everything. In other words, they were just like, well, they... I can tell you, Abram and Sarah weren't just like people today. Yeah, Not even church people. In fact, they, they were far advanced to a lot of professing Christians. The acceptance of this science of psychology has given people leave to psychoanalyze people, try and figure out what makes them tick. Even though the scripture says, no man knows the things of the spirit of a man, no man knows the things of a man save the spirit of man that's in him, so people think they can read your mind or diagnose your spirit, they just lied, that's all they can't. Amen. No man knows that no man can diagnose another man under his own power. God can reveal such things, of course. Now the approach of these Lessons, it's not going to be to gloss anything that looks on the surface like it doesn't look kosher, so to speak. We're not going to gloss any of that, but we're going to always put you in remembrance of the fact that this was lesser light. This is like twilight. This is like twilight. There was very little light of God here. Now, our text begins by saying, Now, now Sarai, Abram's wife, bear him no children. It tells you this is a decade after they dwelt, after he dwelt in Canaan. Ten, and he dwelt in Canaan, dwelt in Canaan refers to after he came from Egypt, he said he dwelt in Canaan. Prior to that, he didn't say he dwelt. So this is 10 years after he came back in from Egypt and lived in Canaan. Now during this interim period, and he was 75 when he left Haran. Now, now let's see, what, what had God exactly told Abram, what's he got to work with? Well, you, you, it's not like this. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> this is what he had to work with. Well, God said he'd show him a land. And God said he'd make of him a great nation. And God said he'd bless him. And God said he'd make his name great. And that Abram would be a blessing. God would have blessed him that blessed him, cursed him that cursed him. In him all families of the earth would be blessed. He said the land shown to him would be given to his seed. God would give the land, he said later, to Abram and his seed. God would make his seed as numerous as the dust of the earth. God would be a shield and exceeding great reward. Abram's heir would come from his own bowels, being begotten by himself. Abram's seed would be numerous as the stars. <coughs> God revealed, he brought him out of Ur of the Chaldees. I brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees, he said. He revealed that Abram's seed would be a stranger in a land that was not theirs and be afflicted by him 400 years. He said God would judge the nation that afflicted them and his people would come out with great substance. 
He said that his seed would come out of Egypt in the fourth generation. He said the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full. He said the land of promise was bounded by the river of Egypt on the south and the Euphrates River on the north. The nations that would be displaced by his seed were named. Now that's it. That's what God revealed to him. You notice there's very little God said about himself. His character, his nature, so what? Very little about himself was revealed to Abram. This is a period of 10 years. It's over a period of 10 years. Now, if you, ha if you had a mature <laughs> child and that's all he knew, you'd say, well, we got to go to work and teach this child a little something. If he, if he knew no more, more than this. But this is all Abram could know. Yeah. Uh -huh. I underscore this. This is all he could know, and none of it was the kind of thing you could like reason out. Like if you could, if you know that Jesus Christ is a Son of God, you can, that can lead you in a certain path of reasoning. But the things revealed to Abraham could only lead to you got to believe this. That's all. That's all it could lead to. It wasn't that that higher level type of truth, if I might refer to it that way. Now it says, now, up to this time, Sarah gave him no children. That suggests that they tried to have children. I, I don't know what sense that would make if they weren't. And the only reason to try and have children was that God said, mm -hmm. you're a seed. See? Right. So I, I assume they had, they'd made an effort. Mm -hmm. So what follows is, is the result of not being successful. Mm -hmm. God said, you're going to have children. Tell them. Who was going to bear him? He did tell Abram he was going to beget him. So apparently Abram didn't consider his own body now dead, nor yet the barrenness of Sarah's womb. See, some people think about that after. I think it was in this interim here too. Made an effort. But see, what God was doing, he was setting up the case. He was setting the situation up. So the only way you could account for it was that God did it. Yeah. So he's eliminated all the fleshly possibilities. Now it says, but Sarah, she had a handmaid. Now that's the first time that word's mentioned in the Bible, handmaid. It's mentioned a number of times, about 48 times after this in Scripture, handmaid. Remember, Mary, Mary, the mother of Jesus, said she was the handmaid of the Lord. Remember, remember her? <laughs> A handmaid's a female slave. That's what she is. Mm -hmm. Peter told him the day of Pentecost some of the handmaids would prophesy. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know where she got. She was an Egyptian. I don't know where Terry I got her, whether when they were in Egypt it was given to her or what, I don't know. But mm -hmm. she was an Egyptian. <coughs> Sarah's handmaid. So now... Moses writing this down now, centuries after it actually happened. <coughs> Sarah, I'd been thinking about this, not about having a family. Uh -huh. That's not what she was thinking about. She was thinking about this promise. So she said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. How did she know that? This sparse amount of information that they'd received from God, they already knew a lot about God's sovereignty that is almost universally denied today. Yeah, that's right. Phenomenal. Mm -hmm. All is revealed to them, she knew, well, the only reason I can't have children is God won't let me. Now the Holy Spirit didn't add an editorial remark saying she wished not what she said. Yeah. Or knowing not what she said, as Luke 9:33 says, says, or she spake this of herself, like John 11:51 says of the Caiaphas. See this? No editorial remark is made. You got to pick up on this. What she knew about God. Yeah. See, Babylon has so successfully blended the wisdom of men with Bible knowledge that it has totally obscured this truth. Uh -huh. Hardly anybody really believes this. They'll say, that didn't come from God. Yeah. That tornado didn't come from God. God had nothing to do with that. 
if a woman couldn't have children, it, it, this isn't what she'd say. She'd consult with an oncologist or whatever you call them. This is what Sarah concluded. God won't, uh, he's kept me from bearing. The normal thing is to bear. That was what God told Adam and Eve. That'd be the normal status. Now we're talking about it's salvation being, the groundwork for salvation being laid. And in it, God's not going to let anything from man get, get in there. From the beginning, it's going to be, God's going to be the one that makes everything happen. If Abel, who looked like he was the seed, is slain, then another seed will be beget. See, God, God will do all this, everything. Together? Yes. Plus, in, in this, they've already gotten a word from the Lord that that they're going to have children. So the very fact that Abraham that, will have children. Yeah, so the very fact that that they haven't had it yet it, it, it is 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 a cause for concern. That's right. On their part, I mean, I, so you can see how how they're they, they, maybe they haven't been as forthcoming as they could, maybe they That's haven't right. done enough, maybe they haven't excuse me entered into the promise. As much as they should have, you can see how she might oh, yeah. be reasoning in the south. See, the thought never occurred to it. The thought never occurred to, eat, to Abram to have a child through somebody else. Uh -huh. So he was not like a licentious man. That's right. Looking for an affair. This, <laughs> it wasn't this way at all. Yeah, brother, given that is exactly the very thing that overshadowed to me <clears throat> the awareness that these brethren were were active. In trying to right. see that this problem, mm -hmm. I never saw that before until until it had come out that God hadn't criticized these brethren. Yeah, so it like opened up a new way for me to look at this text. That these brethren, what they were doing is in the interest of the promise, mm -hmm. it. doing everything they could to enter into. That's it. exactly yeah. it. And as soon as God had revealed to Abram or to, mm -hmm. how this thing is going to work out, if they'd been skewed in the wrong direction, they got right on. They never. They got off that path right away. Yes, that's right. And the same thing will happen here. So she had doubtless thought the seed, we don't have any, we're both getting older, no seed yet. So she come up with this. This wasn't actually a strange way of thinking either. In fact, some of the 12 tribes, their progenitors were begotten by handmaids. Zilpah was the handmaid of Leah, the wife of Jacob, and she bore Gad and Asher by a handmaid, by her handmaid, and they, they were part of the heads of the twelve tribes. Bilhah was a handmaid to Rachel, wife of Jacob, and she bore Dan and Naphtali, and they both headed up tribes. Now, in an almost identical situation, Rachel knew she couldn't have children. She knew that Jacob, he was in the line, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he was in the line for his, he had the promise too that this, his seed would fill the earth. Now here's the account. It's uh, found in Genesis. And when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, give me children else I die. And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel. He said, Am I in God's stead who hath withheld from thee? Oh, he thought the same way, Sarah did. <laughs> who hath withheld from thee the fruit of thy womb? And she said, Behold, thy maid Bilhah, go in under her. My, my maid Bilhah, go in under her. She shall bear upon my knees that I may, that I may also have children yeah. by her. And she gave him Bill, our handmaid to wife. Jacob went into her, and Bill, how could he did bear a son? And Rachel said, God hath judged me, and hath also heard my voice, and given me a son. So, I mean, there it is in the Bible. This is, this is how things were at that time. Now, this isn't the way it is now. I mean, we understand we're living in greater light, but that's the way it was then. Yeah. So this was not like a strange way of thinking. Abram, he hearkened to her and went on under Hagar. Remember, this is during the Dark Ages. 
There's no reason to think that this episode was anything but an effort to see this promise fulfilled. They just, they thought technically wrong, but it wasn't. It was because they hadn't had enough revelation on the subject. As soon as they got more revelation, they didn't think like this anymore. Amen. And Hagar, sure enough, she conceived, which means this was of God. Yes. It's just ten years after they dwelt in the land. Now, it's interesting that Sarah is always referred to as Abram's wife. It's very careful, carefully stated. <laughs> Abram wasn't a bigamist. He wasn't a person that had, like Solomon, had many wives. Not, not Abram. And I list the text. Abram's wife, Sarah. Abram's wife. She's always referred to as his wife. In other words, the Holy Spirit has shaped how we think about Abram. When you think about Abram, you think about his wife. You don't think about Hagar. Even though so far as bearing the child was concerned, she filled the role of a wife. But she wasn't really... Sarah was his wife, and it shapes how you think, how you think about him. Now, there's a lesson to be learned here. Where there's no revelation, people's thinking tends to be flawed. Mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. that's the way it is. I mean, they may be, have some integrity about them. They, they may have a noble objective in mind, but where there's no revelation... Men's thinking tends to be flawed. All right, now, you think of such things as the end times. And there's kind of a, there's not like an abundance of revelation on the subject. And so men, they try to figure out the end times without the revelation. They end up with strange ideas. This is, this is what you got to learn from this. So where there's not a lot of revelation, you can't really do a lot of thinking. You got to stick within the boundaries of what God said and be content with it. Uh -huh. Amen. And you can be. Might, we might add, you can, you can be. Mm -hmm. Faith cannot be initiated or maintained apart from a word. Amen. It's got to have a word from God. Faith comes by hearing. Everything required to sustain spiritual life has been given. Wayward thinking, a lot of it happens when people start thinking about things pertaining to the world, things on the world. They start thinking about trying to figure it out. They're not thinking within the framework of God's Word, so they, yeah. their thinking gets flawed. So you, you think, and God's emphasis in Scripture is not here and now. Mm -hmm. Even in the case of Abram, it wasn't here and now. It was the future, <laughs> even in his case. Even though it was talking about things that occur on the earth, it was after he died that they were going to occur. See, so... He wasn't commenting on the here and now. And for that reason, if a person's thinking is confined to here and now, he'll be wrong in what his conclusions. He, he just won't be able to think straight. Now, as soon as Hagar saw she conceived, she despised Sarah. She looked down her nose at her, didn't respect her. Now, this, uh, Hagar is pictured in Scripture as a type of the law. In Galatians, uh, she, in fact, she's called the second covenant. She, Hagar is the is this old covenant. <coughs> so this is giving you a little tip about old covenant. <laughs> People who live by law tend to criticize those they don't think have what they want. Now, we, I come from a legalistic system. I know, I know this, is how, this is how it works. They get just like Hagar. They get to despising a person that looks like they're, they, they occupy a position that acts a little higher, but they, they look down their nose at them. And Hagar is also a type of the flesh. As soon as they, they seem to have an advantage, it puffs up their pride. Whereas the people of God give an advantage, it humbles them down. Because yeah. they say, I'm the least. Mm -hmm. I'm the least of all saints, Paul said. Mm -hmm. Now when she despised Sarah, this uh, had a reaction. To Sarah had a reaction to this. I'm going to take the charitable view towards Sarah now. Because love thinks no evil. So I've been at, that's how I'm going to view her. Now, Sarah wasn't privy to the will of God. Keep this in mind. 
Keep in mind, we're not to judge according to appearance. And the fact that this is ultimately going to be a shadow, ultimately foreshadows the law and grace, tells me that this, was a, this whole situation was set up by God. Amen. It looks like, according to the appearance, it was set up by Abram and Sarah. <laughs> But it wasn't because shadows, God doesn't look at something men did and say that's a type in the shadow. God always creates the type in the shadow. So I'm saying, I'm going to take the position that this was created, this situation was created by God. That God was in this because he's going to use this and he needed this kind of situation. And so that's what he did. Now Sarah said to Abram, my wrong be upon thee. All right, the men now, they really, they run with this one. Here's some of the versions. May the wrong done me be upon you. That's the New American Standard. The NIV says, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. The Holman Christian Standard Bible says, May the wrong done to me be on you, or the New Revised Standard. The Holman Bible says, This outrage being done to me is your fault. The way version says, Thou dost unjust, thou doest unjustly with me. God's Word Bible says, I'm being treated unfairly, and it's your fault. Septuagint version says, I'm injured by thee. Message Bible says, my violence is for thee. Apostolic Bible, Jewish Bible says, I am being wrong because of you. Brent's translation says, I'm injured by thee. English Revised Version says, my slave girl now hates me and I blame you for this. The Message Bible says, it's all your fault that I'm suffering this abuse. The Amplified Bible says, May the responsibility for my wrong and deprivation of rights be upon you. Now, some of those have a hint of truth in it, but it's just a hint, let me tell you. Well, I, I give these different versions to show you that in most versions of the Bible reflect the theology of the writers. They're really not translating the Bible. And if they say they are, they're lying and they don't know it. They're really not translating the Bible. They're putting their ideas into the Bible. That's what they're doing. Although Sarah, now, <laughs> Abram's going to tell Sarah to handle it herself. Because Sarah was the manager of the household. And the person who dishonors the manager dishonors the manager's head was Abram was Sarah's head. Now I want to take a moment here to uh, say a little bit about this. This follows through the kingdom of God. If you despise Jesus, you despise the Father that sent him. You despise who Jesus sent, you despise the one who sent them. You despise the wife, you've reproached her husband. If that's how it is. And that's what she's saying here. Hagar did not have the option of honoring Abram, but despising Sarai. Amen. Yeah. And she's going to be reminded of this. Hagar forgot any benefits she had and was prideful. Now Sarah says to Abram, the Lord judge between me and thee. Now some versions read me, don't I decide who's right, I or you. That's the Jewish Bible. Good, good, God's Word Bible says, May the Lord decide who's right, you or me. May the Lord decide between you and me. The Lord will show who's wrong, you or me. New Living Translation. May the Lord judge you for doing this to me. Living Bible. You've done me wrong and you'll have to answer to God for this. New Century Bible. I want the Lord to judge which of us is right. English Revised Version. Now Sarah's not like heaping a curse, because I'll curse in the curse thee, that applies to Sarah too. That's right. She's not been given a license to curse, curse Abram. And I don't believe this is what she's doing. 
What she's intent, what she wants, she wants God to settle this whole thing. That's what she's saying. She turned it over to the Lord and she wants this case adjudicated, not to decide who's right, Abram or her, but who's right, Hagar or her. And this would also involve Abram because he was her head. And her being reproached meant that Abram was being reproached. So saying the Lord judge between me and thee, it was like it was like a cast in lots. She didn't know who, how this was all going to turn out. But she was willing to let it rest with the Lord. It's like when they use the Urim and Thummim, two different stones. They'd reach in, one stone meant yes, one meant no, and when you pulled it out, that was it. That's what this was. The Lord judged between me and I'm casting my lot into the Lord's lap. Now Abram responds to it. He doesn't say, well, thank you. After all, I'm the boss. I should be making these decisions. He said, behold, thy handmaid is in thy hand. And do her as it pleases thee. And so she did. Now, <coughs> I mentioned she's the head of the household, and this is a consistent representation in Scripture that the wife is the head of the house. Nowhere does it, nowhere does it say the man is the head of the house. You think it does? You just try and find it. It says he's the head of the wife. Doesn't say he's the head of the house. Woman is the head of the house. And this is this is taught consistently. Paul said the woman is to guide the house. Some versions say rule the house. The women in scripture they were used of God, the household was called her household. That Shunammite woman refers to her household. The households are the the woman in the virtuous woman in Proverbs 31, it's her household. Mm -hmm. She looks after the affairs of her household mm -hmm. and her husband safely trusts in her to kind of run, run the things. So Abram, he fit right in with this. See, Abram knew this. Mm -hmm. This is taught in Scripture, but this is, this is not being taught today. Yeah. So a lot of women who are very competent, the church has made slaves out of them. And it's, it's a deplorable. Hey, Brother Gibbon, as you were talking about this matter with Sarah uh, throwing, it's seemingly blaming her husband, but it seems seems like Sarah saw to some indication that this doesn't just seem right. This is a, this, this, in her mind, I, I can see where it just, just this isn't, what she thought the fulfillment of the promise was going to be. Yeah. And so there, even though she didn't understand it, she was willing to, to hand it over to the Lord. Yeah. I mean, because uh, later, later when, when you know, when he, the, the Lord comes and she laughs, and, and that, that period of time when she has to wait that six months or whatever yeah. it is, see, she didn't, that when she, she was with child, she wasn't like, well, this can't be right. I, you see what I'm saying? I, yeah, well, I, she, when she said, my wrong be upon thee, what she was saying was, Hagar's reproached you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not just me. Mm -hmm. Just like if you, if you berate believers, you berated Christ. Yeah. Because they belong to Christ. He's their head. So this is the way it, it's the way it works. So he, she appealed to him to uh -huh. do something about it. And, and he said, well, you can do it. You can... You can, this is in your hands. Do whatever you think is best. I don't know. Maybe we done went through this part of it or not, but now was she out of line for doing this or not? Was she what? Was she out of line for suggesting this or not? No, uh, suggesting Hagar? Yeah. No. I think God was the one in this. God dictated this. No, she wasn't out of line at all. I said because this was standard procedure to begin with. Yeah, I remember. This was standard procedure to begin with. This wasn't in the 20th century. This, this wasn't after Jesus died. Mm -hmm. So no, she was not in line at all. No. Yeah. God was in all of this establishing what mm -hmm. Paul was going to preach later. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, he was. He set this up 
Well, he, I mean, he could have he could have kept the peoples from having that tradition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, he could have he could have done anything he wanted to. Yeah. But he the the entire thing was of the Lord from start to finish to absolutely step establish without without there being even a, a toehold mm -hmm. for someone to to think otherwise mm -hmm. that, that somehow people made this come to pass. Yeah, that's right. And uh, he was establishing that firmly mm -hmm. so that we knew that whenever Christ came, that this was, he came by the will of God, that, mm -hmm. that flesh and blood couldn't take any credit for it. See, this is something that's going to later yeah. be bigger than mm -hmm. just this circumstance yeah. here. And he was starting the nation. He was establishing his people, mm -hmm. calling them out, making them a people. He was going to reject things that had to do with the earth mm -hmm. and he was going to accept the things that he had brought to pass himself and he was defining clearly what was the difference between those two mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they're just God is all of his works are done in righteousness mm -hmm. yeah he, he he would have been obligated by his own character mm -hmm. to rebuke reject correct Exposed yeah. if there had been something amiss here, mm -hmm. and he did not. All that the scripture tells us mm -hmm. is about how God approved mm -hmm. of what Abraham yeah. did. Yeah. See, the thing to remember here is that, f so far as the birth of the promised seed was concerned, she was wrong that that way. But so far as the birth of a people that was going to fill the earth. Yeah, that's right. She was right. Yeah. That, that is what she was thinking. But that's that's how... See, God is not only providing the offspring for people in the Hebrew nation to be uh -huh. saved. He's also providing for the population of the entire world. Yeah, that's right. Which he's going to spread his knowledge abroad. So that that's where that's where Hagar's child comes yeah. in. And the angel is going, <coughs> is going to right. tell her that. That's right. going to tell her this is the case. So, yes, yeah, so far as the Messiah was concerned, for the promised seed, the heir... She wasn't thinking correctly, but only because she didn't know. Mm -hmm. But as so far as God is concerned, he's creating another body of people that's necessary mm -hmm. to the fulfillment of his purpose. Yeah. <laughs> you see? <laughs> yes? Well, it's also good to keep this in mind. This is with the promise in mind. It wouldn't be like Abraham saying, well, I want a new wife. Yeah. I'm tired of this one that I have. Thus they would just, you know, bring up the lust view or something like that. I'm wanting something new because this mm -hmm. is getting old. With the promise in mind, this is the from their viewpoint, this would be the only way. It, but as you mentioned, like God showing how men think, it would be like God stepping back and saying, all right, this is all you know, let's just see what they do with it. But it won't just stay that way. He'll come in and then he'll show them, well, this, yeah. is, how I, this is how I'm going to do it. See, here's another thing. To, after, the, after all the things are in, after all the facts are in, everything's happened, there's nothing men can brag about. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I could tell you Sarah didn't say, well, I'll tell you what I did. I, I told him, Abram, to go to Hagar. Yeah. Yeah, that was one of the smartest things I ever did. Yeah. It was just the kind of thing, uh -huh. it happened, God was in it, it happened, but it was not the kind of thing that bolstered pride yeah. <laughs> at all. And yeah, that, that's, that's in this too. Yeah. That is in this too. Now Hagar runs away. Some versions have that she was abused by Sarai. Some even said they beat her. Para beat her. I don't think that's right. I I don't think that's what happened at all. But I think she was a God. She did. She forgot she was a slave, and Sarah did whatever was necessary to remind her what she really was. She ran away. The angel of the Lord found her. This will be most interesting now. Mm -hmm. The angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness. I hope that where he found you too. Yeah. Found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou and whither wilt thou go? She said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself under her hand. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child. 
and thou shalt bear a son, thou shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. He shall be a wild man, his hand will be against every man, every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. She called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me, for she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Wherefore the well was named Bir La Heroi. Behold, it is between Kadesh and Barad, which is uh, yeah, Barad. Now this is one of the most extensive passages in the Bible spoken to a heathen. There's, there's some other passages where God spoke extensively to a heathen. Cain's one. Hagar's one. Abimelech, King Egypt, he was. Pharaoh, God spoke quite a bit to him. Balaam, Nebuchadnezzar, Cyrus. These are some heathens. God spoke a lot to them. Now I mention this because I was raised up with a theology that God didn't have anything to do with people that were not a covenant people, that they were kind of on their own. God, God didn't do anything with them. This is not true. The world of Noah's day had no covenant with God, and God de dealt with them. The builders of Shinar, Sodom and Gomorrah, and Egypt and Nineveh, and the Amorites, Tyreside, and Babylon, King Herod. There's a lot of yeah. incidents where God judged people that were in no covenant relationship with him at all, mm -hmm. but they were responsible to God. Amen. See, this is why it's absurd yes. to tell anyone, make Jesus your Lord. Uh -huh. What the Bible tells you to do is confess Jesus is Lord. Not make of your Lord. Confess He's your Lord. Because He's Jesus is Lord of all. There isn't anybody Jesus isn't the Lord of. The absolute Lord of. There isn't anybody. He's not. Now the scripture says the angel of the Lord found her. You know, that doesn't mean he was walking about and stumbled on her. He was sent. Angels are sent from God. Sent to Hagar. Because Hagar's association with Abram, that brought God into this scenario. So an angel is dispatched to her, and right off the bat he brings up that she's Sarai's maid. See, angels know a lot. Yes. Angels know a lot. That's why women are told to prophesy their head covered because of the angels. Uh -huh. Angels attend ch churches. Yes. <laughs> I know they're disappointed mm -hmm. most of the time, but they're there. Because mm -hmm. this angel knows your Sarai is made. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say, Sarai, free woman, you've got your rights. Now what he said, she was still Sarah's, Sarai's maid, even though she ran away. She is still, whether she acknowledged it or not. When she hears from heaven, she'll, she'll not be commended for what she did, and Sarai will not be condemned for what she did. Amen. Just to set the record straight. Mm -hmm. So when he asked her, hey guys, quite honest. Of course, you tend to be that way. You don't men don't lie to angels. <laughs> Scared to. She said, "I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai." The word "mistress" see, it's changed. Just me. People use it different today. It's like a second wife today. Uh -huh. Mistress in the Bible is your is your master's wife. Uh -huh. It's the lady who has charge of you. The basic Bible English version is incorrect in saying, Sarah, my master's wife. That's not a right translation. It's, an impo it's imposing a person's theology on the Bible. Yeah. Abram wasn't her master. Sarai was her master. Mm -hmm. yeah. Abram knew it. Mm -hmm. The angel knew it. It's just that people today don't know it. Which roughly translated means they're ignorant. Yeah. So he tells her, go back to Sarai mm -hmm. and submit to her. Yeah. Oh, and it tells you Sarah wasn't wrong, see. Mm -hmm. Nobody has a 
it's that she really did belong to Syria. Now this is living in a twilight age. Understand they didn't know what we know, but you can't judge these people in the light, blazing light of the exalted Christ and the Son of God. You can't look back at Abram and Sarah and evaluate them by what you've seen. Yeah, they didn't see it. Because yeah. God didn't show it to them. In fact, sin took man so far from God, it took it took 2,500 years before God spoke really clearly about much at all. It was, Mo, it was the time of Moses. 2,500 years. <laughs> That's more than a third of the history of the world. <laughs> 2,500 years later, he tells Moses, he gives a law that kind of spells things out a little bit more. These people didn't have that. Yet as I say, they... They actually knew more about God than many, many Christians mm -hmm. know about God. You'd be surprised. Now, you have to do your homework here. If you ask people, just come right out and ask them what they know about God. If they give you something for 10 seconds, you'll be, you'll be, you'll be blessed. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot known about God. They'll tell you what God isn't. Mm -hmm. God doesn't. They'll just tell me about what do you know about God? Mm -hmm. Himself. And of course there's uh, quite a bit been revealed. The peak of it has been revealed in Christ. Amen. So the angel does to go back mm -hmm. to your midst to submit to her. And get, get underway. He, he didn't finish though yet. He said the angel of the Lord said unto her, now I'm going to, he's speaking for God. When he says I, he, do, he doesn't mean me the angel. Yeah. He's a messenger. Angels are messengers. He says, I is quoting God, see. Amen. I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, and it shall not be number for multitude. So you're going to be a lot of people. Yeah. See, because way down the road, God's going to fill the earth with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a body of people called Gentiles that are going to hear the truth. Mm -hmm. And Hagar is going to have a role in those Gentiles. In fact, if you trace it back, some of us probably came yeah. from Hagar. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't have to be ashamed because God recreates you in Christ Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Hagar's seed would be multiplied. God, God's in this. In other words, God's in this whole situation. God's in it. God's working out his purpose. Sarai is not working out her purpose. Abram's not working out his purpose. Hagar's not working out his pur her purpose. God's working out his purpose. Yeah, yeah. This is the way he chose to do it. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Amen. So I'm not going to... Why? Because this way all the bragging rights go to God. Right. Nobody can take credit for bringing Jesus into the world in any sense. Yeah. Uh -huh. Nobody can do it. Yeah. When it says he sent him, that's exactly what it meant. And it all uh, is because of he orchestrated situations like this. And these shall all the families of All the earth. families are there. So we're creating some families here. You can see it. You can all see the sketch. Yeah. He's creating some families. Yeah. Amen. And he told Abram, nations are going to come out of you. Mm -hmm. yeah. he's, created, he's creating those here. Mm -hmm. Yes. One thing I was also thinking about earlier was that nothing that man, see, stepping back, that this is orchestrated of the Lord. Nothing that man does is going to cause God to change his plan or eternal purpose in any in any way. Mm -hmm. uh, these people and nations that came from Hagar continue to be a source of thorns and enemies to the people Israel. Yes. And that type of thing had to have been orchestrated by the Lord or he wouldn't have done it in the first That's place. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Brother Gibbon? Yes. Would it be right to say that... Um, that if the Lord, if God would have given just any person to have Jesus as a child, would it be possible to say that they might have bragged? So the Lord had to pick a specific person. Oh well, yeah, they would have, and Jesus wouldn't have been what he was. If Jesus had been born in Rome, forget it. He wouldn't have been in the temple at twelve. He could not possibly have been born in the United States of America. He'd have been raised up a spiritual nutcase. He wouldn't have been. Yeah. 
See, God's behind this. God made sure when his son entered the world there was a body of people that were scripturally literate. No, they weren't perfect. No, they weren't could be justified by faith, but they were light years ahead of the people we deal with. They knew the scriptures. Honest people in that economy could raise Jesus up so when he was 12, he wasn't in the youth group. He was down there with the doctors of the law asking and answering questions. That's the seed that come from mm -hmm. Sarai. Yeah. <laughs> now the angel said to her, you're going to, he knows all about it, said, now you're with child. And uh, you're going to bear a son. There's going to be a son. They didn't have, you know, the scopes and all that. You're going to have a son. And you're going to call his name Ishmael. All right, there's a, there's a few people in the Bible that were given their names from heaven. Not many, but there were some. Ishmael, he liked the first. Isaac, he was. Solomon was given his name. His name's to be called Solomon. John the Baptist, his name's to be called John. And Jesus, his name's to be called Jesus. That's it. That's the only names that God dictated. That's how unique this is. He says, now I'm going to tell you why you call him Ishmael, because God... Now notice, it doesn't say God has seen your affliction. God has heard your affliction. Which means it had, must have been enunciated. It was very difficult for her. Other versions say he's given, he's heard your misery, in IV says. The ears of the, ears of the Lord open to your sorrow, basic Bible English says. English Standard Version said he listened to your affliction. Well, I won't go. This is, you're being introduced to God here. This, this is God now. Yeah. You're being introduced to God. This is an Egyptian. <laughs> she's, a, she's not a chosen race, not of a chosen people. But God pays attention mm -hmm. to people's afflictions. Yeah. And some people, he does something about it. He's going to hear, God's heard your affliction. If he heard her affliction, what about yours? I mean, you should, uh, <laughs> you got the guarantee. You know, Egyptians didn't have the guarantee. You do. See, affliction, it has a language of its own. When a person's in affliction, it means it's uh, sorrow and pain that they can't resolve. It's not something they can solve. It's just that you're under the scourge and it hurts. But it's good to know God. Uh, God hears your affliction. Amen. Well, remember that now when you're in bad state, nobody around to help, and you, the devil will make some suggestions to you. You don't deserve this. You can say, well, I deserve a lot worse than this. If you really want to get right down to it. I got more blessings than I got affliction. Amen. You remember, he considers affliction. Scripture says he looks on affliction. I gave some text there. It says he's seen affliction. He considers affliction. He beholds it. He regards it. He remembers it. That's God. Duly notes it. This time he said, called an angel. Got a commission. Go down there. Down the land of Canaan by next to by Kadesh Barnea, there's a woman sitting at a well down there. This is what I want you to tell her. It says, I heard your affliction. I assume she called on the name of the Lord. It doesn't say this, but let's say she did. How, how did she know to do that? This is not Egyptian knowledge. Well, she'd been living in Abram's house. She was living in Abram's house. And Sarai, his wife, and they knew about God. They didn't know much, but well, they, what they knew, they must have passed on. What, what, what do you know about God? Have you passed it on? Yes? Also, I mean, she had, she had, had Ishmael, and, and the reason why she had him was because they were looking for the seed, the promised seed, yeah. so they had, a, they had to have talked to her about this and told her, you know. That's right. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, this affliction was uh, Hagar wasn't guiltless in this. No. She despised Sarah. Yeah. 
And the same spirit that was in Ishmael when he mocked Isaac <laughs> was in Hagar that's when right. she despised Amen. Sarah. Yeah. Amen. And that's the, this this flew in the face of a, a, this was like wrong. Uh, Solomon he he did right that for three things the earth is disquieted and for four which it cannot bear. And one of those things was a handmaid that is heir to her mistress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, she was exalting herself. That's right. Amen. And, uh, God, God allowed for Hagar to to be the mother of, of Ishmael who became a prince of nations for a reason. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't because Hagar was such a wonderful little no, girl. No. Uh -uh. That's why the angel said you go back to Syria and submit to her. Yeah. But she had she had the spirit of Egypt. That's right. Amen. <laughs> As I said, she was a type of the law, those living under law and the type of the flesh. Now the angel he told us he's gonna have a son. He's he's got a lot of mulled people two of the people gonna come from him. And he's gonna be a wild man. Actually, the literal translation, he's going to be a wild ass of a man. That's what it says. So I was into what is exactly, what kind of animal was a wild ass. It looked more like a horse than a mule. But it was a, it was a Roman animal. You, you couldn't be domesticated. You couldn't, you couldn't help make a barn. Couldn't be contained. It's a restless animal that just roams about. Scriptures talk about it in a Job, Job 39. Who has sent out the wild ass free, or who has loosed the bands of the wild ass, whose house I have made the wilderness and the barren and his dwelling. So he got, God made this animal to dwell in the places where there weren't friends, you know, <laughs> hostile environment. He's a type of certain kind of people. Jeremiah wrote a wild ass used to the used to the wilderness that snuffeth up the wind at her pleasure and her occasion. Who can turn her away? The idea is she she thinks she's free. She's just just jumping around doing nothing and free. Something like a, a little little child, you know, they just jump around, not do anything, just jump around, roll on the floor, and we don't say, well, they look at what they're doing there, you know. This is a wild ass was that kind of animal, just kind of frolicking around all the time. That's how Joe, that's how Ishmael's gonna be. He's gonna be against every man. He's not gonna be able to get along with anybody. Yeah. You, you probably bet people like this. And nobody will get along with him. Every man will be against him. I remember this is a type. God has set up this this type. He said there in Galatians 3, he says, Hagar and Sarah, he says, these, are the, these are, represent the two covenants. Mount Sinai does in Jerusalem and Hagar and Sarah. They're types of the covenants. And old covenant people, whether they're Israel or whether people trying to live under law now, are like wild people. They're flitting here and there. They're unstable. They're not solid. They're not discerning. They have more interest in fun, this sort of thing. This is how they are. And they can't get along with anybody. If, I, if you're part of a legalistic form of religion, as I say, which I, which I once was, you, that's about kind of how you become. You can't really get along with anybody. Nobody get along with you. This is not an ideal situation. Surely you must see. Yeah. So after you reveal this to her, she called the name of the Lord, not called on the name of the Lord. Now keep this in mind. The text doesn't say she, she called on the name of the Lord. She called, the, she named God. In fact, some versions say that. New King James Version says she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees. The NIV says she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. New Revised Standard Version says she named the Lord. God's Word Bible says Hagar named the Lord. New American Bible says to the Lord who spoke to her, she gave a name. 
New Living Translation says Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord. So she actually gave God a name. Yeah, she's not the first one that did this. She is the first one who did this, but not the only one who did this. The naming of the Lord, ascribing a name to God, always followed some kind of a unique experience with God. Abraham named the Lord Jehovah Jireh. Genesis 22, 13, and 14. Moses gave the Lord's name Jehovah Nissi. That's Exodus 17, 15. David, a single word, the Lord is my shepherd, as a single word preceded by Jehovah. Gideon named him Jehovah Shalom, Judges 6, 24. So there are people that gave God a name that reflected their experience with God. With Hagar, she gave him a name that said, he, f he found me and he knew everything about me. Yeah. Oh, you've come a long way when you know that. Yeah. Yeah. Now there's some names, I won't go over them, there's some names that are given to God in Scripture. Most of them are transliterated, they're not translated because there isn't a parallel word in the other, in the other languages. But there's a number of them that are in the list of here that are given in Scripture. And they uh, they're quite unique, all of them. There are some names given after Christ are some names by which God is known. I'll name a few of them. The Lord thy God, the Lord, the Lord God Almighty, the Lord of heaven and earth, God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, God and Father of all. Heavenly Father, Abba Father, Righteous Father, Father of glory, Father of spirits, Father of lights, God of the Jews, God of patience, God of comfort, God of love, God of grace, God of all the earth, God of heaven, Lord God omnipotent. Well, we learn a lot more about God in Christ than was ever known before. Amen. Mm, you got to pick up on that now. God's revealed more of himself in Christ. So there are people that make a big thing out of the names of God in the scripture. They, but they always confine themselves to the Old Testament, I've noticed. Now, Sarah Hagar said, he gave him the name, said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That's the NIV. King James says, I also looked after him. That is, I saw him like as he was leaving, <laughs> is the idea, the afterglow. Now here again, the various virgins, virgins, they create like a fog. Let me give you some of them here. The New American Standard Bible says that I saw after him. The Douay version says she saw the hinder parts. God's Word Bible says She saw in the place, she emphasized the place that she saw him. The Amplified Bible says, seeing the future divine purposes for her. <laughs> I see this as an expression of wonderment of uh, Hagar. She's running from Syria, I think, and she's getting away. God apprehends her by this angel, tells her a lot about herself. Tells her what kind of child she's going to have. Tells her what kind of mold is going to come from her. She says, oh, I've seen the one who's seen me all along. All along he's seen me. Now I, I know it now. That's like in Christ, that's like the hour of conversion's nigh. Suddenly it dawns on you. Whoa. God's over me, God's hand on me, God can do with me anything he wants and he'd be right in doing it. He's found me and now I can see it. That's the prelude to salvation. That's why people want to be saved. They wouldn't let the message go any further. What must we do? They just stop it. Yeah. Say something. That's why the Philippian Jesus, what must I do to be saved? He's broke in and said it. I, I couldn't estimate how many thousands of services I've been in. I, from my youth up, uh, thousands, I, maybe a hundred thousand, I don't know, but it's been way up there. I never heard anybody interrupt a message. Yeah. That, that's it, I, what can I do? Mm -hmm. uh, 
Never heard that happen. Not in the churches I've been in. But it happened in the Bible. Uh -huh. Here it happened to Hagar. Yeah. She gave God a name. And she named the name of the place Beer La Heror. Which means the well of the living one is seeing me. She named that well. <laughs> now you'll find that frequently in scripture. People had named places after they'd seen God. Jacob raised up a pillar and gave it a name you know, and so forth. So it's difficult to, in other words, this is very personal. When God dealt with it, it's very personal. Of course, that's the only way God deals with people. Yeah. God deals with people on a group basis when it comes to edification, exhortation, comfort, so forth. When it comes to personal per, people personally coming into contact with him, it's just like you and God are the only people there. Uh -huh. And nobody's going to be converted until that perspective comes. Amen. It's me and God, and it doesn't look good for me. And until that time comes, salvation's a long way off. Not going to happen. So it was very personal. Now it says of Abram at the time, he was 80, 86 years old when Ishmael was born. 86. Now I just want to take a moment here to ask in how you should look at your life. I've heard testimonies that talked about I was bad and I was really bad and I did this. Someone else kept saying, well, I was worse than that. I did something worse than that. And I, this is not a good testimony. If you're going to testify, testify what God's done to you, not what the devil did to you. Amen. This is bad teaching. That should be happening. People should be taught this. That when you glorify God, not, God's not glorified by what you was. He's glorified by what you are. Yeah. Now, if you lay out Abram's life up to this point, I got a little chart there. He's got some peaks and he's got some valleys. The valleys was a famine experience, remember, when he went down to Egypt? When Abram and, and then the affair with that thing, he had a conflict with Pharaoh down there. There's Abram and Lot separate. That's a low point. There's the incident of Hagar, low point. Look all the good things. Yeah. He was called, he ride in Canaan, land promised to his seeds, land promised to him. He defeats five kings and their armies. He's blessed by Melchizedek, a seed is promised, a covenant is made, Ishmael is born. When you look at your life, you'll learn to look at it from what God has done, from that viewpoint. And you say, well, there's not many things. Well, they're all bigger than you think. If you dwell on them, every peak you find, they'll be like a mountain range in there. It'll look like a mountain peak, but you get to looking at it, it's like a whole mountain range. And give God glory for what he's, what he's done. Now it says that Abram gave Ishmael his name. Now the name was revealed to Hagar, but, it, but Abram named it. Abram called his son's name. It was revealed to Hagar. So I, Hagar must have told him. Some say, well, God revealed it to him. I, I think Hagar told it to him. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now, there's several names in Scripture that I mentioned that have been given of Solomon. God said, his name shall be Solomon. Uh -huh. Isaiah's son, Meher Shalhal Hashbaz. Be a good name, and you're going to have children. There's a good one. Mayor Shell has El Hashbez. Then the Lord said to me, Call his name Mayor Shell El Hashbez. Hosea had a son through Gomer, and the Lord said, Call his name Jezreel. Hosea's daughter through Gomer, God said unto him, Call her name Loru Hama. Hosea had another son through Gomer, and God said, Call his name No Lo Am I. Jesus is told, John, uh, G, both Jesus, uh, Mary and Joseph were told his name should be called Jesus. John the Baptist, his name should be called John. So that's, it, that's all I could find. But there's some places that are key people. God like said, here's what you name them. With the single exception of Jesus, the revealed name was given to only one person. But with Jesus given to both. <laughs> yeah. 
And I conclude that it, on the basis of this that Hagar probably told Abram what the name was. And Abram was 86 years old. He was 75 when he came out of Haran. We don't know how old he was when he first got the call in Ur of the Chaldees or precisely when he left Ur of the Chaldees, but it was 1,500 miles by foot from Ur of the Chaldees to Shechem and Canaan. And he spent some time in Egypt, and 10 years after he came back, he had this son. All right, now I want to give you what that entire scenario, from Ur of the Chaldees all the way up to our text, I want to give you Paul's word on this. Romans 4.18, Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall I seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he is about a hundred years old, neither yet the dead is the Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. That's his analysis of the whole situation. So we say, well, didn't Abraham doubt? It hadn't been revealed. It wasn't until the year before Isaac was born, when Abraham was 99 years old, until that time God never did tell him Sarah was going to be the mother. That's right. He, <laughs> and he didn't know he's going to be the father until after he'd been in Canaan for a while, and he said, no, you're, you're going to beget the seed. What this text is telling you, remember, we mentioned this, that God evaluates faith after it's been tested. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. He does it, when your faith is being tested, like Abraham's faith is being tested by his own impotence, by Sarah's barrenness, by the famine in the land, by, by Egypt, his faith is being tested. But the, an official pronouncement on his faith was not made during the test. Yes. Amen. It was made after the test. Mm -hmm. It's the same with you. Yeah. You might see someone, they might be appear to be halting. They may be in the midst of some great trial. Like Peter denies Christ three times in one night. Yeah. But before that night ends, mm -hmm. he recouped. Amen. Amen. And he wasn't evaluated. No one brought that denial up later. Am I right? Uh -huh. Paul never said, you remember Peter denied Christ three times. I mean, what about that? It never brought up. Why? Because that was a test of his faith and he recouped. Uh -huh. And it just took a look. Yeah. Jesus just looked at him. Uh -huh. And he recuperated. See? Uh -huh. So you learn this from God. I don't think anybody ever really told me this. I know I'm not the only one that sees it, but it's important for you to see this, that when your faith is being tested, that's not the time to be checking out whether the, whether, how you're doing. And the survival is the thing you've got to concentrate on. There comes a time on the evil day when the most important thing is standing. Yes, amen. That's the most important thing. You don't make progress when you're standing, but there's sometimes that that's, the, that's what you've got to do. You've got to hold the ground you got. You can't let Satan push you back. Yeah. So you lose ground. See, I've seen people, I know people, with name them by name, that lost ground. They lost, they went backward. See? You can't go backward. And if you don't, that'll never be brought up when you were just struggling just to make an inch of progress. You really had to throw yourself into it. But that's, that's not going to be brought up. The fact that you survived and overcame the world. That's the thing that's going to be accented. 86 years old. <laughs> All right, now in Abraham, he, he provides us a living, living documentation about what faith is. That's what he's held up for. He's just the father of the faithful, the father of all that believe. Abraham's the father of us all. If you don't have that kind of faith, you don't have faith. I really want to stress this now because this is not popular today, but so what? This is the kind of faith that saves the soul. Nobody will be saved by any other kind of faith, and any other kind of faith is spurious. It's not real. This is real faith. Faith survives. Faith listens to what God says and shapes, reshapes the life. If they're headed in a different direction, they regroup. 
live up to that revelation. Now we uh, here focus on edification and building up the saints of God. That to me is the most important work in all the world. Because if you're not ready to go to heaven when you die, guess where you're going to go? So getting ready, growing up into Christ and all things. He's told you what this is all about. Yeah. Going from glory to glory, even by the Spirit of God. In that process, faith is, is being fed. Mm -hmm. And every time you see some kind of new, new perspective, you're... You, got, you get spiritual peripheral vision. You get, oh, you see a little more. You want to right there that day without delay adapt your life. Yeah. Amen. I'll tell you right off the bat. You'll lose some friends when you do this. Yeah. But just practice this. Yeah. Farewell. Mm -hmm. Always live up to what you know. Yeah. And God will show you more. Now this is categorically taught in the third chapter of Philippians. Paul there tells you what motivated him to count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. He said, I don't consider myself to be perfect. I haven't apprehended that for which I've been apprehended, but I'm pressing toward the mark. I'm throwing myself into this. I'm not going to let anything stop me. Yeah. Now, he didn't throw over being a drug addict or something like that. He threw over his religious career. That's what he threw over. Yeah. Press on. Now I said, let as many as be perfect, or we'd say mature, think this way. Think the way I'm thinking. And he says, if any, in anything ye be otherwise minded, this is Philippians 3.15, as if you can't see this, God will reveal this to you. God will show you the truth of what I'm saying. But here's how I'll do it. Live up, walk by the same rule. That is, do what you do to please God all the time, no, for no other reason, and pretty soon, all of this will make sense to you. Yeah. Abraham lived that out. Amen. See? He lived up to what he received from God, uh -huh. and God gave him some more. Uh -huh. He lived up to that, God gave him some more. Uh -huh. And the same is, is true of you. Uh -huh. All right, I think I'll close there. Any of you have something you'd like to add tonight? Given the, uh, one of the chief traits of... People that possess faith is faithfulness. Faith what? Faithfulness. He's faithfulness. the father yeah. of the faithful. Amen. And, uh, you know, for a long time when I grew up and heard uh, the account of Abraham, I just kind of assumed, I don't think this was ever taught me, I assumed that he got the promise one day and then very shortly had a child. I just I just kind of thought that's kind of how it worked out. But we're talking a pretty long duration of time. 20 More, something. 25 20, years. 25 yeah. years. Yeah, that's right. See, faithfulness... <laughs> Isn't something that's manifest in like that's a right. flash of a moment. That's it's right. something that you see over a duration of time. And so I appreciate that about Abraham and Sarah. They always kept to what God had called them that's to. Right. Didn't get distracted from it. Yeah. And over all that period, God says of Abraham that he trusts, he considered not his own body now dead, nor yet the Sarah's. See, he's becoming more and more dead as duration's right. going on. Mm -hmm. But that's he right. considered the faithfulness of his yeah. God, mm -hmm. that he keep his promise. Amen. And Amen. the thing I appreciate that about that is that there's one faith. Mm -hmm. That's right. So if, Amen. If, if in a twilight era, as, as you've mentioned over and over, Abraham can keep the faith for 20-something years. Mm -hmm. What can I do with what I've been given that's right. Christ? Mm -hmm. If I truly have faith, now that's something to be determined there, but if you do, if you keep the faith, the faith will keep you. Amen. Mm -hmm. Just think. Go ahead, Brother Tony. I'm sorry. No. Sarah, she was barren up until the time she was 89. Yeah. Isaac was born she was 90. She was 90 and Abraham was 100. So for... 90 years she was barren. Yeah. But when she was 89, the angel of the Lord visited them. Yeah. And God told Abraham, about this time next year, Sarah, yeah. Yeah. I don't mean to be crude, mm -hmm. but they went right to work yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. on having that child. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. So she, I mean, this wasn't like a miraculous birth. Yeah, that's right. It was, 
The miracle was that Sarah received strength to conceive, but she had to do something to conceive Amen. that was totally unreasonable for a 90-year-old woman. Yeah, that's yes. right. Amen. Yeah. They lived up to what they had, see? Uh -huh. And then it will find it all through Abram's life, all through his life. Whenever God showed him something, he adjusted and lived up to it. That's what faith does. Uh -huh. Anyone else, Brother Tony? Uh, I was thinking about the hardship and the difficulty that's always associated with doing what God said to do. Uh -huh. Now, it's been uh, quite some time that Abraham was first given a promise. Yeah. And now we have, now Sarai, Abram's wife, bear him no children. Yes, that's right. So they've been... That's right. uh, so they've come to this conclusion. I, yeah. I'm not going to be able to have any children. Yeah. The Lord has, what was the word she used? The Lord has uh, restrained me. Yeah. Restrained me. Yeah, that's right. So, but then I, I got, and, and this is something that you can, you can pretty much count on that God tells you to do something, God has promised you something, but you, it's going to be difficult and that's hardships right. associated Amen. with that every time. Mm -hmm. You're just going to have to work it out. Amen. Yeah. And uh, I, I was. Uh, it's wonderful to see that how God blessed all their efforts, though. Yes. Amen. Uh, Amen. And it reads it just like it's just so. Did he tell, tell you what happened? Well, see, he's traveling through. That's and right. Doing all these other things <laughs> too. So, but he's, he's blessing Abram, Abram mm -hmm. and all these and all these efforts. Mm -hmm. See, this incident with Hagar could have interrupted the whole thing. Yeah. I'm sure Satan, see, Satan writes to work in all these circumstances yeah, uh -huh. too. And I'm sure he would have loved to just have Hagar disappear from the scene. And, uh -huh. Yeah. I know he wouldn't let it happen. Concerning what you'd said about the, what an effect lack of revelation will have on what a person does, that same principle still applies oh, yes. to us. And oh, yes. Going through this just made me think about things that I've done in my past due to lack of knowledge, just not knowing certain things and it affected the way I, you know, did certain things, but having known those things now it completely changes the way you look at certain scenarios and how much more serious it is for us now having the revelation available rather than them. It's just, it wasn't revealed to them, but to us it is revealed and people still don't make right choices because they don't see it. They don't see it, that's right. Brother Jeremy? Yeah, I was, I was thinking about the same thing Brother Tony was talking about, how the Lord, He doesn't do anything. It's all for His glory. So it's when um, the Lord's working, Not I've seen over and over again throughout the Bible as you're going through this, the Lord doesn't ever make anything easy. There's different, there's trials and things, but um, faith isn't like a magic wand. Today, the reason I'm saying this is because today I... I've listened and, and um, heard people talk about faith as if they, they've got some kind of magic wand now and if they just wield it and, and, and do it just the right way, God's just going to come and give them whatever they want. But see, that's not the way it works. Yeah. God's, he has a purpose and faith sees that God's going to make it happen and it's going to per perfectly work out. It may, it may we, there's, I mean, through, throughout this whole thing, you see, Trials and struggles and hardship, but that doesn't deter a man of faith yeah. seeing that God is going to um, work it out. Amen. Amen. And it, now next time we're going to be in the 17th chapter, and that's only the third time God appeared to Abram. That's so only the third time. In this case, he sent an angel to Hagar. He didn't send one to Abram, but to Hagar. I was thinking too um, how we talked about the amount of revelation that they had. Why it's so important now that we speak the things that we know, yeah. because um, like Sarah, Sarai received strength after she was told these things. That's right. So as That's we right. tell what we know, then people receive strength. Their faith, they can gain. That's you know, right. they can get stronger in their mm -hmm. faith and be able to make it. Because there's so many that haven't heard the truth. Mm -hmm. oh, and amen. Been able to respond. Amen. Amen. Yes, but Aaron. Charles Spurgeon used an, an analogy with regards to uh, different perspectives. Mm -hmm. Is uh, Abraham could be likened to a man making a journey through a forest, and then from our perspective, reading his account is like looking down on his journey from a mountaintop. Yeah, amen. And so for Abraham, he doesn't know. Yeah. What's to the left and to the right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Dead. But when you're up above, looking yeah. down, yeah. his his steps and 
in his journey may look like bad decisions, but mm -hmm. for him, this he's in his journey. That's right. right. And it's really a, a very uh, unwise mm -hmm. um, choice of words to level any criticism. Yeah. See, there's yeah. an, there's yeah. an ultimate perimeter to God's purpose. Okay, At first, it's real broad. But he, with each revelation, it gets more narrow. More narrow. So Abraham, he's at this where you just think God, God's almighty. That, that's about, that's about all he yeah. does. That's about all he do. God's almighty. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know a lot of people don't know that today. Sure. This is inexcusable not to know that today. Amen. It's inexcusable. Because mm. God has not, not only said it, he's demonstrated yes. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Other, that's going to be the testimony. That's that right. Inexcusable on the final day. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, it's a great uh, relief when you realize that Abraham trusted his wife to do the right thing. He said, "You, you, you she's, she's your, your, she belongs to you. You do what's you best." Do what I, and, but yeah. it's a great relief when you realize that you've been put into a body, and you're not. You know, you can expect more of yourself than what you really. <laughs> what you really can do, but the body, see, it can do it. Yes, the body, sir. it's been given the, the the ability to be able to edify itself together yeah. in love. Body so of Christ, you yeah. do, the body of Christ. So you don't have all of it. Christ has all of it. Yeah. But you don't. And to but see, you can be tempted. I know that the flesh sometimes say, well, but you should you should take it on yourself to do. Abraham didn't do that. Yes, he trusted his wife to do the right thing, yes, and she did the right thing. This is a thing, when, when Hagar was out there and the angel was talking to her, you go back and you submit, that was proof. She did the right thing. That's Whatever right. she did, it yes, was right. That's right. Mm -hmm. I just think, it, there were just two of them. Yeah. Abraham and Sarah. Yeah. They, they, and the text doesn't tell about their conversations, but you can kind of pick up that there had been a lot of communication uh -huh. between them. And when Hagar came back, she had a little added, yes. little added perspective there. That would make, see, God had told Abram a couple of times, many nations. Mm -hmm. Now, Hagar comes back with this word, oh, yeah. that's where yeah. something's going to come from. Yeah. He dwelt in the midst of his brethren, mm -hmm. his brethren meaning the children from Sarah and the children from Keturah. Uh -huh. And so I don't think we went into that, but Ishmael never blended with the yeah. other people offspring of Abram. He never, but he stayed close by, but he never blended with them and didn't get along with them. Yeah. Well, I, I can imagine this makes for a tough situation at home with, uh, with, with that going on. Oh, yeah. uh, but see, they were able, and, and so, but it, it, mm -hmm. it, they were able to work this out yeah. anyway. Yeah. Uh, Amen. And, and bring about God's uh, purpose. Amen. Yeah, but it doesn't. And we we sit isolated from it, but then we can project ourselves in, into it and, and reason that this made for some tough adjustments and mm -hmm. and, yeah. and way Hagar was and yeah. and the attitude she got when she came back and and all this involvement in the family that that, that made a tough situation for oh, them. Yes, but it was yeah. God's desire mm -hmm. that this be worked out and it's kind finally of, had to throw pitch him out. Right. Yeah. 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 It wasn't Amen. easy. Yeah. yeah. Eventually. But when God said to do it, they yeah. did it. Amen. Amen. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Mm -hmm. Our heavenly Father, we're grateful for the revelation of our father Abraham. We want, Father, to please you as he did, be your friend as he was, be trustworthy. We thank you for the faith that you've given us, for the way you sustain us. We pledge ourselves to live only for thee, Lord, not for self, and to be numbered among the children of Abraham. We thank you for this privilege in Jesus' name. Amen.